So let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, thank you for bringing us here today to learn more about you and the Holy Eucharist. You are the consoler of our souls and the source of all grace. Lord, we ask you to let the grace shining from your Eucharistic heart touch our souls today and open them to your healing love. May our mother on this feast day of the Annunciation intercede for us and draw us ever closer to your Eucharistic heart as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary, Mother of the Eucharist, pray for us. Mary, Tabernacle of the Most High, pray for us. Mary, Great Adorer of the Blessed Sacrament, pray for us. Mary, Mother of Healing Love, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. There is one thing God does not know. There is one thing God does not know. Can anyone guess what it is? God does not know how he could give us a greater gift than himself, and he has given us himself as bread in the Holy Eucharist says my dear friend, St. Augustine. The Holy Eucharist, the blessed sacrament, is God. Just think about it. The God who made the heavens and the earth, the animals that live upon the earth and those that swim in the seas. He made the great mountain ranges and the deepest sea trenches, the most magnificent canyons, and even the minute shrubs that cover them. This God, who is the great artist of the universe, who made the wonders of the earth and the splendor of the skies, by the very word of his mouth, was pleased to create us and to remain with us. This is the God we come before when we enter the church. This is the God we kneel before in the blessed sacrament. The living God is in our midst. He is completely present to us in the Eucharist, and he has divine power. Why would this great and powerful God humble himself under the appearance of bread and wine? Why would he lower himself to become food that mere men can eat? Because he is a God of love, and like all lovers do, they long to be with their beloved. And so God comes to us and remains physically present with us in the Holy Eucharist. And it is in the Eucharist that we encounter the healing power of God. He wants to heal us. He wants to give our souls, wounded by sin, the fullness of life. In fact, he says, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. And just as medicine can help restore our bodies back to the fullness of life, God gives us supernatural medicine to restore our souls and to give them an abundance of life. We need the Eucharist, which is the medicine of immortality, as St. Ignatius likes to say. We need the medicine of immortality to renew restore and transform our souls back to the fullness of health and life. And so this is what I will be talking about today, the Eucharist as medicine. So before I begin, I'd like to start with a, a couple of stories. Um, years ago, our religious community ran a children's home up in Rochester, New Hampshire, and we received children from many broken families. There was this one child that came to our children's home from 
a family that was very abusive. And she was a young girl, eight years old. Um, but she was very energetic. Three days into her stay at St. Charles' home, um, she began running around the couches at, in the playroom. And she got all 28 other children to join her. <laughs> you can imagine how chaotic this was. All the children were running feverishly around the couches in the playroom, huffing and puffing. And they wouldn't stop, no matter what anyone did and no, no matter what anyone said. It was so difficult to break this cycle that mother ended up calling the priest, asking him that he bring the blessed sacrament. And within moments, father appeared and right away stood on the stairs with his alb and stole in his humeral veil, holding the blessed sacrament in the monstrance. As the kids were coming around the corner with the little girl at the head of the group, she, she stopped in her tracks yelling, everybody, kneel and adore, Jesus is here. <laughs> and she fell on her face, and all the other kids fell prostrate on the ground before the Lord. It was quite a scene to behold for the sisters. This little girl, who never heard about God, recognized his real presence in the Holy Eucharist. There's another story about this girl, and she was at Mass. She was kneeling right next to Sister Mary Rose. And it came to the point in the Mass when the priest, lifting up the consecrated host, said, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Everyone responded, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter, enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. And she immediately turned to Sister Mary Rose and said, What's the word? I need that. <laughs> she most certainly wanted the healing power of God. <laughs> and just like this little girl, we all should have an eagerness to ask for and receive healing, especially when it comes to our souls, the innermost part of our being, because it is in our souls that there are areas that are darkened and torn by sin and the effects of it, whether it is from broken relationships, traumatic experiences, stinging words, whatever it may be, God wants to heal you. And we need God's healing love. It's it, and the, his healing love is in the Eucharist because that, he can only take away our sins. So these words we say at Mass, Lord, I am not worthy, come straight out of the Bible and are found in the Gospels. When a centurion goes to Jesus to heal his suffering servant at home. So I'll read the Bible passage to you. And when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, begging him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. If the centurion the servant was healed at that very moment. The church changes the word servant to the word soul. My soul is not worthy. But we can look at the centurion as a model and learn from the way he asked for healing. Now, if you're not aware, a centurion is a Roman uh, officer. He's not a Jew. Um, and he is a commanding officer of approximately 100 soldiers. Uh, this centurion was unique. He was humble. He came acknowledging his unworthiness to be in the presence of God. Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. He had great faith. He believed in the goodness of God, his desire to heal, and the power of his word. Just say the word, 
and my servant will be healed. And he persevered. The centurion knew that he himself was not a Jew, yet he eagerly sought the Lord's assistance. He came to Jesus begging him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home. The centurion shows us how we can ask for healing in the midst of our suffering by being humble, faithful, and persevering. It's clear in the scriptures that Jesus is attracted to these virtues as he said to the centurion, go, let it be done for you as you believed it would. And his servant was healed. Jesus comes to us in his compassionate presence in the Holy Eucharist with a divine power to heal. But we must desire his healing and ask for it. Now, there are a couple types of healing. There's physical healing of our bodies. There's inner healing of our emotions and memories. And then there's spiritual healing of our souls. And today I'm going to talk specifically on spiritual healing and how we can receive healing from the Eucharist. So spiritual healing is the highest form of healing because it is the healing of our soul, which is at the core of our being. The soul is eternal. It is the life of the body. The form, this form of healing is often set aside and ignored by people, but it is the most needed in our society because sin wounds our souls and leaves our spirits crushed and weak. This is precisely, precisely the reason why Jesus came in the first place, to take away our sins and to heal our crushed spirits. There's a story I just love in the Gospels. It's right after Jesus calls Matthew to follow him. And Matthew th throws this huge party, inviting his tax collector friends and Jesus. And when the Pharisees see Jesus uh, sitting at, in the, this, at this banquet, um, they criticize him for sin sitting with sinners. And Jesus' response is just awesome. He says, those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus' mission here is to call us out of sin. His mission is to be the divine physician of our souls. So when our souls are wounded, uh, the wound needs to be addressed in order for it to be given the proper medication so it can heal. If it goes unchecked, however, it can get infected and fester. So kind of like a bad scrape on the knee, we want to get that checked out by the doctor. Um, we need our souls to get checked out by the divine doctor. So first we need to address the wounds in the soul. This can be the most difficult parts of the healing process because it's hard to see and look at the pain as it is. When we sin or someone sins against us, it can create deep injuries and sometimes it's hard to look at those. The divine physician sees our wounds, but he can't heal them if we don't bring our hurting souls to him and earnestly ask him for healing. Second, we need proper medicine. Jesus has the perfect medicine for our wounds. He himself in the Eucharist. When we go to receive the Eucharist, we are physically touching Jesus and he is touching us. He restores our souls back to health. Did you know every time you worthily receive communion, Christ heals you? Jesus always brings healing through the sacraments. Since through the sacraments, we receive grace, which heals and sanctifies our souls. So when you receive the Eucharist, Jesus is healing and sanctifying your soul. These healing graces that flow from the Eucharist come right from Christ's passion, death, and resurrection. It is from the cross that the ultimate healing action occurred because that's where Christ destroyed death and took away our sins. We receive the fruits of Christ's victory now through the sacraments. Isn't that amazing? What Christ did 2,000 years ago is applied to us today. When you participate in the Mass, when you receive the Eucharist, when you visit Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, you receive the healing fruits of Christ's victory over sin on the cross. 
Christ's heart was pierced so that our heart may be healed. And from his Eucharistic heart comes a torrent of mercy and love. Pope St. John Paul II says that all the fruits of Christ's passion, death, and resurrection are concentrated forever in the gift of the Eucharist. There's this story about this young boy who often got in trouble with the police. <laughs> uh, and one day, a policeman picked him up in his cruiser, and the, the boy thought he was driving him to the station. But the policeman said, I'd like to introduce you to my friends. And soon enough, they were parked in the church parking lot, and the policeman put the kid right into the church, under watch, of course. And at this time, the Blessed Sacrament was exposed on the altar. At first, the boy didn't know what to do. He was so flustered by this unexpected visit. But little by little, as the boy gazed upon the Eucharistic face of our Lord, his heart began to open, and he began to pour out his troubles before Jesus. It was there that he encountered the healing love of our, our Eucharistic Lord. His life was totally changed. Now, healing is a wonderful thing in itself, but this, it's important to understand that there is a purpose to healing. God doesn't heal us so that we can return to our fallen ways of sin. No, he heals us so that we can return to him. He wants us to be transformed by his grace, just like that young boy. Sometimes it's easy to uh, get into the routine of going to Mass. We walk into the church, we bow, cross ourselves, slide right into the pew, go through the motions, and once that, once that final blessing is given, we shoot right out of there. And I could say this out of experience. Um, <laughs> but we, we're in a huge battle against familiarity, apathy, and indifference, okay? God wants to give us profound healing graces. But here's the catch. The amount of healing we receive is dependent on the amount of faith and love we have in Christ. Our hearts must be disposed to the healing graces God desires to give us. Our mother superior likes to tell us young novices in the community this uh, story about the mass uh, he likes to compare the Mass to the Niagara Falls. If you've ever been to this magnificent, huge waterfall and heard the rush of the running waters pounding heavily on the rocks and crashing on the waters below, that is what the Mass is like. God pours down an abundance of grace upon us in the Mass. But here's the question. How big is our capacity to receive that grace? Is it our capacity the size of a thimble, or maybe the size of a jug, or maybe the size of a tub, or maybe the size of an ocean? Clearly, God can open our souls more to receive his healing graces. And so I came up with four ways to do so. And help to help remember those four ways, I came up with an acronym, HEAL, H-E-A-L. H, have faith. E, eagerly prepare. A, aim for thanksgiving. And L, let your sins be forgiven. So H, have faith. The first way we can open to the grace of God is to have faith. Faith that God is truly present in the Eucharist and that God wants to heal us, okay? This faith should be alive and expressed in the way we act. Do we kneel with reverence every time we come before our Lord in the tabernacle? I'm not talking about the pop-down, pop-up kind of thing. This is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings that we come before. Just imagine how the angels come before our Lord, the throne of God. And when we enter the pew, what do we think about? Do we greet God by talking to him in prayer? I mean, we're entering his house, of course, so it's only right to say hi. God wants to converse with you. He wants to talk to you and to listen to you. E, eagerly prepare. The second way we can dispose our souls to the healing graces of God is, by, is when we prepare for the Mass, where we will encounter the divine physician of our souls. 
I once read this beautiful text about the importance of communing with God before communion with him. We can talk to God before even entering the church, like right when we get out of bed or on the drive to, to church. Tell him the things that weigh on your heart. Speak to him about your joys and sorrows. Ask him for healing. It is important to consider what we think about and talk about before Mass, because those thoughts and words are what we carry into the church. One great thing that I know to be very helpful to prepare for Mass is to pray da the daily readings of the Mass. It can be the night before or the morning of, but I know that the Magnificat and the Word Among Us are two great booklets that have the daily Mass readings in them. And you can also look up the daily readings on the USCCB website. Okay, A, aim for thanks. Another way we can prepare uh, and be more receptive to the grace at Mass is to thank God for his great gift, the great gift of himself in the Eucharist. When we are united with God in communion, we become living tabernacles because we hold within ourselves the real body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us consider then how we pray after receiving communion. Some people pray Thanksgiving prayers that saints have written, such as uh, Thanksgiving prayers by St. Thomas Aquinas. Other people like to pray with a, a mental image of our Lord, such as his sacred heart. I personally like to pray with the Psalms, uh, the Thanksgiving prayers to God for his wonderful gifts, because I'm very good at getting distracted. Um, there are many ways that people pray, but it is important that these prayers are of gratitude, praise, and love to God, who has given us the greatest gift ever, himself in the Eucharist. And then L, let your sins be forgiven. Last and most importantly, healing graces flow from the confessional. The sacrament of reconciliation is crucial in the process of healing. It is there that our misery encounters God's mercy. The church actually calls this sacrament the sacrament of healing because our sins are forgiven by Jesus. We are reconciled with God, and this brings us healing and restoration. The sacrament of reconciliation is the best way to dispose our souls for holy communion with God. It is Jesus who forgives sins in the confessional, and he makes us holy. And the holier we are when we are united with God in communion, the more graces we receive. It's important to note that we cannot go to, to communion if, there, if we are in a state of mortal sin. Uh, this is a sin that is grave and which is committed with full knowledge and full consent. But what is amazing is that God's mercy is greater than all of our sins combined. And he gives us the sacrament of reconciliation to return to him. If the Eucharist is medicine, then the, the sacrament of reconciliation is heart surgery. So remember, heal. H, have faith. E, eagerly prepare. A, aim for thanksgiving. And L, let your sins be forgiven. Okay. I, I'd like to close with a story about a girl who made her first communion. Um, this girl received the Eucharist for the first time. And when she did, she returned to her pew and she became very fervent and intense in prayer. And um, a person noticed her and asked her after Mass, what were you praying about? And she responded, well, I told Jesus and our Father, and then I told him a glory be, and then I told him a knock-knock joke, and then I told him a ghost story. <laughs> Ah, the beauty of the simplicity of a child who knows that she can talk to Jesus about anything. The reality is the real presence of the person of Jesus is in us when we receive communion. St. Jose Maria Scriba says, when you approach the tabernacle, remember that he has been waiting for you for 20 centuries. This is the God of love. And he gives us the medicine we need that heals our broken souls and restores them back 
to the fullness of health and life. So let us end with, with prayer. Um, I found this prayer from the breviary uh, the, that the church prays. And it's actually a song, but I'm going to be reading it in prayer. So, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Shepherd of souls, in love come feed us, life-giving bread for hungry hearts. To those refreshing waters lead us, where dwells the peace your grace imparts. May we, the wayward in your fold, by your forgiveness rest consoled. Life-giving vine, come feed and nourish. Strengthen each branch with life divine. Ever in you, oh, may we flourish. Fruitful the branches on the vine. Lord, may our souls be purified, so that in Christ may we abide. Sinful is man who kneels before you. Worthy of you are you alone. Yet in your name do we implore you. Rich are the mercies you have shown. Say but the word, O Lord divine, then may our souls be pure like thine. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.